privilege to pick up 1 Corinthians where we left off last week. Alex finished up chapter 3. I get to pick up chapter 4. And uh, I, I want to tell you, I want to tell you, it is a challenge to be told what to preach. You think it might be easy, but it's a challenge, especially when you're doing line upon line and moving things through. I've preached through 4. I've done lots of things. I've referenced all these verses in 4 over and over and over again, but to go, you have verses one through seven, it's like, okay, totally easy. I've preached through Corinthians so many times, and I get there, and I'm like, wow, that is really difficult to do. So all these people who are coming up to preach, what we tell them and what is, how we've broken it down, uh, give, them some, uh, give them a little respect because it is tough. It is tougher than I thought it was going to be. And when we started this out, I did start off, and I was more of the talking about the history of the church and those kinds of things, and that's easy for me. But then we get into this area here where Paul talks about leadership. But it's not leadership so like in your face. He's using himself as an example. And so I'm going to dive into the example he talks about today and also unearth some of the things that in that time, as he used certain words for cer certain things, he was forecasting and he was also calling people to a deeper understanding of certain things. So when you read through this, you could read through verses 1 through 7 and go, huh, that's interesting. And you could go on and probably not get so much out of it. And that's what I started when I read through it. I'm like, huh, by itself, he's just talking about himself. And then I started looking at the original language. And you, you know this about me probably by now is... I don't want to interpret the Bible. I want to understand its intention. And there is a difference. People can interpret it like, okay, I can use that verse anywhere I want in my life because I can claim it. So I'm going to name it and claim it, and I'm going to, I'm going to make it fit my situation. And the scripture was not written that way. The scripture was, here's what I mean, and I mean what I say. And here's what God was saying in that moment, and this is how he meant it. Not, hey, how do you think that applies to you today? No. It's the intention. So I want to dig into Paul and what he was talking about. And we were jumping off. I, I used to dive as a swimmer. I used to love getting on the diving board and do flips and double flips and all these gainers and different things. So we're going to do a gainer, like a forward gainer, right into where we left off last week. And where we left off last week was several weeks of Paul saying, Hey, you all, I hear you're divided. I hear you're getting into different camps of leadership preferences. I hear you're getting into different uh, camps and divisions of, well, you like Paulos, Apollos, you like Cephas, you like Paul, and he's talking about himself. There's different preferences among you, and we need to stop that because Christ is not divided, neither shall we be by our preferences. And he's diving into how the church, as we come together, we need to be one body in Christ Jesus. Amen? It's one body. We have different families around, you know, different parts of the body around this city, Tucson. We have different families, but we're all one body. And the preferences he's talking about in Corinth were affecting the people where they're actually becoming polarized to other believers and not being able to walk with them by how they appreciated what Cephas says versus the way Paul said it, the way the difference between how Apollo said it. And they were getting into these camps. And how many know cliques aren't good, right? Families should not have cliques. Your family, when you gather together, should not, click, should not have cliques. We should all be together. Yeah, we'll have different subjects and talk about different things different ways and get into our own personal conversations, yes. But Paul was really worried about the Corinthian church because they were in the middle of, of a warfare of culture, because that culture was all about men, wisdom, you know, not, not just men, but women, right? But when I say men, it's people. Men's wisdom and the ways that the culture was thinking was jumping in to the church and trying to live there. And Paul's like, no, no, no. What's out there stays out there. 
What, what's out there is not the kingdom, is not heaven. We're here to be a light so that they can see the light of heaven on earth and they can see that we are Christ because the way we love each other as Jesus commanded them. Remember Jesus said they're going to know that you're my disciples by your love, right? So Paul was taking that up in the middle of Corinth. So there's some words that we are going to dive into today. The first one is servants. He talks about servants. The second one is stewards. And then he uses these words judge. In, in my Bible, I see judge, judges, judged several times. And two of the times he uses it, it means one thing. The third time he uses it, it means something else. <laughs> Welcome to Greek. Okay, the Greek language. So to begin at the top of 1 Corinthians, where, where I've been given this opportunity, we have to take a little step back. So before we do the front gainer, we have to take a step back and get a runway. So the runway needs to be the last couple verses of chapter 3. So 1 Corinthians 3, 21 and 23 says this. And Alex talked about this last week. So then, I like that. So then. No more boasting about mere mortals, right? It's not Apollos. It's not Cephas' teaching. It's not my teaching. It's not about your preference. It's not about the mortal side of this. It's about the spirit. It's about the kingdom we're battling here for, right? So no more boasting about mere mortals, for everything belongs to you. Now here we go. Ready? Everything belongs to you. Sweet. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, period, everything belongs to you and you belong to Christ. And Christ belongs to God. In that, we could just talk about that for a decade. Everything belongs to you, but I want to tell you, you belong to Christ. So truly, it's not even yours. And what Christ has been given to him by his Father. So really everything is whose? God's. We live in a kingdom. Christ is a king. He owns everything. And we might have our hands up upon it and responsible for it. But when it all comes down to it, it's the king's. So he's setting this precedence right here. And how many know that when you read the scripture, somewhere uh, a group of people sat in a room and decided we should break this up right here because when the scripture was written, it was all continuous or contiguous. Is it, which way did I say it, Jay? Contiguous or continuous? It's contiguous, right? Contiguous. Next, to. Next to contiguous. Okay, so continuous. All right, thank you. I'm learning. We're all learning together here. All right, okay. See, been out of school too long. So it's all a... It's all in one linear fashion, written in one continuous fashion. And some, some people sat in a room someday and said, this should be chapter one. This should be chapter two. This should be chapter three. Why? Because when we write books, we write in chapters. We write in breaks and pauses. And sometimes those pauses don't make sense because we need to understand the context. So that's why we need to jump back to chapter three to go into chapter four. So everything belongs to you, but you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. Therefore, <laughs> verse 1 in chapter 4, one should think about us, Paul, Apollos, Cephas, this way, as servants of Christ, there's our, our word, servants of Christ, and stewards of the mysteries of God. Verse 2, now what is sought in stewards is that one be found faithful. So for me, he says, it is a minor matter that I'm judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I am not acquitted because of this. The one who judges me is the Lord. So then, there's another so then. So then, do not judge anything before the time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the motives of hearts. Then each will receive recognition, which is praise, from God. There was a lot that was said right there, but also maybe if you read it on your own, you'd be like, that is nice. Moving on. But what he was saying there is deeper 
than our English language gives us. So Paul was speaking to the Corinthian church. That's our context. Speaking to the body to clarify further how to view Apollos, Cephas, and himself, and to further expose how earthly-minded people were being. Anybody earthly-minded in here? Right? We think certain things because of certain situations, because we learn certain things certain ways, and that becomes our habit and our rote way. And there's this thing called myelin in your brain. Myelin is a, is a circuit insulator, which you probably understand circuit insulators, makes it so you know, the electrical pulses in our brain, when they travel certain ways, there's this thing that goes and wraps around our nervous system, our, our, the nerves that are firing, and insulates them to become stronger and stronger. Therefore, habits, ways you think, ways you don't think, this myelin doesn't wrap itself around, and then you stop thinking that way. So the things that we think about a lot and the things that we do a lot are firing in our brain so much that they become the way we think and the common things we do. That is so geeky, Rich. Okay, move on. Okay, all right. So I just learned about how people think the other day, and it's pretty interesting. So when we are earthly-minded, not heavenly-minded, which Paul was talking about in, previous, in a couple of previous chapters, it's not so good. Because we think God... Heaven should act more like earth instead of earth acting more like heaven sometimes, don't we? Because we need stuff. We think certain ways. And Paul is coming to this church going, okay, don't let earth come into heaven's realm here. Don't let the culture come into the kingdom. The kingdom must be heaven on earth, and you must be sons and daughters living in a kingdom. So since we know that up until this point, the people of this church were becoming polarized by their preference of how the gospel was delivered and how Paul, Cephas, and Apollos differed in even their leadership styles, and they all had a choice. I prefer, I prefer Paul. I prefer Cephas. You know, they were polarized. Paul was trying to help them think right, repent, and understand the real value of what these three men were doing. So think back as a child. Do you, do you ever remember a time where you saw a present, either Christmas or your birthday, and you knew that present was different. Like, hmm, okay, that, there's something, mm -hmm, there's something special right there. Maybe as you're, maybe you ladies, as you're older, you see a small little box, and you're like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right, but you're looking and you go, that wrapping, that container, that's something special, right? You ever remember a moment like that? Right? You go, mm -hmm. and then if you were me, you'd probably go up to him and try to move it and shake it and try to figure out what it was. And then your mom saw you and like, stop it. So just as a child looking at a gift, looking at the wrapping, understanding there's something special about it, all the, the gifts that God gives us, he gives us for ourselves, for his kingdom, and he appoints people as gifts to the body, and he gives gifts to the body through leadership. That's just what he does. And Paul is talking about this in this context when he says stewards and servants. He's trying to help them understand. Now remember, for things like gifts, the family of God, the, the heart of God is to love his family and to care for his family. So he gives ministry gifts to the church. He gives ministry to you to care for yourself and your family. Leaders fathers, mothers of your home are gifts to your children because you raise them up in the admonition of the Lord and raising them up in the way that they should go. Every leadership context that we have is a gift. Now, not every leader feels like a gift all the time. And I can imagine at this time when Paul, Cephas, Apollos, and they started having their preferences, people were making judgments at that point going, I just don't appreciate that. I don't like the way he looked at me. I don't like the way he said that. I don't like the way he talked about that. And they were making these minor judgments that they would call preferences. And they were measuring the delivery of the gift. The gift looked a certain way, acted a certain way, and they did not see the value of it when all the gift was designed to do was to preach the gospel and obey Jesus. And Paul was saying that clearly in this moment. And how many have had a boss that you're like, oh, wow. 
He is making me go up to the cross every day and just uh, go to the cross and die because a very difficult person, right? Anybody have one of those? A difficult boss. Well, really, if you saw, if you saw the kingdom right and you saw who you were and who they were, they were a gift to you. And if you don't believe that, look at David and King Saul. King Saul tried to kill the boy. King Saul tried to throw a, a, a spear at the young man who was there serving him to kill him. And God kept going after David's heart. And what did God finally say about David? He's a man after my own heart. Because when we look at the gift and we understand leadership, no matter in the home, in the workplace, in the church, the body of Christ, they're all gifts and they're all going to demand something of us. But it's not the gift itself. It's the command of God to submit, to live under, and to become something that is more than the moment to become more like Christ in the middle of it. And Paul was talking about this. Paul was making it super clear that the gospel was the goal, not the gift of the people. The gospel is the goal, their message. Any division in the church over method or delivery of leadership or style was just foolish, and the church needs leaders, and to that end, God calls people as he sees fit. Dang, because I'd prefer this kind of leader. I'd prefer this kind of boss. I'd prefer this. And you can go find those kinds of things only if, only if, and there's an if coming. Paul, like a father, had to take the kids in Corinth and speak to them like mere children looking at the rapping of the leader. Paul was going after how to perceive those who stewarded the word of the gospel and their leadership traits. And Paul had to do this due to their foolish, fleshly, and humanistic preferences that begin to divide them from each other and their ability to receive leadership from Paul. So if you had three different camps in one church, how do you think that would be on a, you know, they didn't have a Sunday morning, but they kind of did, but they didn't. How do you think when they gathered, how do you think that would look? Would it look like unity in the body or would it look like three different bodies? It would probably look like three different bodies. And Paul was after them saying, okay, we're focusing on the wrong stuff here. People are going to hell and you're focusing on your preferences and your preferences come from internal judgments that you have. Get rid of all those things because they're separating you from one another. And they're only going to know that we love Jesus by how we love each other. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the church, we're finding ourselves not loving each other. We have a problem. Do you see that? We can't do that. Plurality of leadership is a thing. It's great. It's the strength. There's five gifts given to the body to, to get strength to the body, to lift up the body, to, to train the body. But you can't just go after one and love the one. You have to receive all the gifts because we need to be together, not divided. Have you ever had a talk? I don't know. If, how, how many have had a brother or sister? How many are lonely? Only lonely. Only children. Okay. Poor Megan. <laughs> okay. So you didn't have this problem. Maybe you had it, maybe you didn't in certain ways. But when you grow up in a house of multiple children, were you ever allowed to just be outside the family dynamic? You were always pulled in. It might be doing the dishwasher, it might be in the dishes, it might be taking out the trash. You had responsibility for the house, and you had to play right with your sister. You had to play right with your brother, right? You had to be a good family member. And that's all Paul's after here. Because there's something greater at stake. It's the gospel. And if you remember, right out of the gate in Corinthians, he started talking about unity. And he was more concerned about Jesus Christ and him crucified being among us than about the preferences of things. So first, servants. Let's talk about this word servants that he used. And we call it servants. So when you think of servants, what do you think about? What do you think about? What pops in your mind? A butler. Yes, sir. Whatever you like, sir. You know, a butler, somebody who's subservient to somebody else, right? So there's different words for servants in the Bible. One is child. One is like unto a king. 
This one is different. He uses a word. Here we go. It's, it spells like hyperetes, but it's not. It's hoop I ret ace. That's all I got for you. And he uses this word at the beginning when he says this. He says, one should think about us this way as servants. So he's bringing clarity. But what he's saying here is he's actually talking about a job. Someone who works on a seagoing vessel. He didn't say someone under a king or a child in this case. He's saying someone who has the job of an under rower. An under rower was that person, and maybe you've seen movies like this, and it's kind of like this, where there's somebody who is at the bow of the ship or behind them, usually at the bow, and they have a drum. And you're supposed to go, you're supposed to row to the beat, right? Why? Or the ship would be like, yeah. So they they had to figure out how to keep the ship straight. Yeah, they had a rudder, but they needed all the momentum and all the power going one direction. So they had rowers, but the rowers didn't decide where to go. The master did. And the master wasn't actually the beat, the, the drummer. It could have been. You could think of it that way. But there's a lead and there's an under rower. Je- Jesus is the master who is given to us, right? And Jesus called Paul, called Cephas, called Apollos, called you, And says, you are an under rower to me. I say where we go, you row. I have the direction, you follow. Right? Do you get the picture? He's using this word to say, hey, myself, Paul, Cephas, and Apollos, (laughs) we're under rowers here. We're we're just rowing, right, to Jesus' beat, to his direction. So he's using words that kind of made people go, oh, okay, yeah. He didn't use the word of like, I'm a child to somebody, so I am, you know, under somebody that way. I'm not as a king or a governor. I don't work for them. I actually have nowhere to go, nowhere to direct it. I just do the rowing. Interesting word. I like how he did that. He's just clarifying it there. He had to remind them. They were under masters as well. Every leader should have a leader. And every leader appointed by God, every mother and father, you can lead yourself well, but who's leading you? Right? He's just getting into their, he's getting right into their mess is what he's doing. So Paul knew what was working in the people when they had these preferences working amongst them. And Paul knew that underneath these expressed preferences were these judgments And he was going after them to clarify, to kind of clean the deck, per se. So secondly, Paul uses this word steward. Steward. It's kind of an interesting word, isn't it? Steward. How many times you use steward in your life? Not very often, probably. So he reminds them of what stewardship was in the church. So Paul's language here calls attention to the position in which God appoints leaders over the flock, over the people. And Paul used a word that some of you might recall. Have you ever had a, do, how many people like Greek yogurt? Come on, come on, come on. There's a word in the Greek called oikos, and it's not just yogurt. Okay, it's not just yogurt, people. It means household. So oikos, y- yogurt is household yogurt. Man, it sounded fancier when it was just oikos. But oikos means household family, right? So that's what that word means. And Paul uses the word oikos with a little bit of a authority behind it. He says oikonomos here as steward. And steward, again, is used different ways, but not this time. He's saying things entrusted with the owner's property. So a steward in this case is appointed by the owner. Right? So a good steward. And we see the story of the good steward. We see, there's different ways that uh, this word is used. A little more common than the other one. But the stewardship that any leader is called to is solely called to by God. God is the one who authors the leader's credentials to leads and appoints them. Every leader God appoints 
must only be sub subjected to the Spirit of Christ and the fear of the Lord. It's an interesting thing. When a steward does their job, the steward isn't worried about how the household workers view the steward. The steward is only worried about the master. Because I need, I need to, as the steward, fear what the master says, do what the master says, not what the grumbling household workers are saying or the people out in the field are saying. They, they need to just get their job done and do what they need to do. And if they have a question, you know, I'll give them direction and those kinds of things. But I really need to focus as a steward to what the master says, right? A true steward is worried about the master, not the underlings, not the others. So living in the fear of man, if a steward lives in the fear of man, if a leader, you know, even as a mother and a father, you know, a business owner, if we live in the fear of man, we will always be at risk of not producing the things of God. If you live with the fear of man on you, you're at risk of not producing the things of God. Why is that? Your focus needs more focus. You're focusing on the wrong thing. We are subject to the master. We all are. We have to hear God. We all do. And we can hear human ideas and reasoning all day long and hear it. But we need to make sure that we're hearing who? The Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, and be accountable to that. And Jesus talks about that. Paul talks about that, the fear of man. We cannot have the fear of man. And when we do, we are at risk of not producing the things of God in our households, at work, anywhere we go. Second, the qualifications of staying in a role in God's eyes, as he said it, is faithfulness. And I found that very interesting when he says that. In verse 2, he says, Now what is sought in stewards is that one be found faithful. He put no other criteria around that. Yes, there's other criteria that comes with gifts and callings and ministries and those kinds of things, yeah. But in this case, when he's explaining this to the Corinthian church, he goes, all that should be found in a steward, someone who is over something under a master, all we're looking for, the right picture, what good looks like, is faithfulness. It's not style. It's not the gift, the wrapping, the presentation. It's faithfulness. Why? Because he knew that we had to get there. He knew that we all needed to be in order. And he knew that they had to be submitted to the master. And thinking in the context of sheep and a, and a, and a shepherd, that shepherd has to be faithful and not go off and leave the sheep alone. We need faithful leaders. You've got to be faithful with your kids. And I'm always enamored and in awe of watching, you know, so Shayla just had Faith. And Cody and Angie, right? Cody and Angie just had Hallie. And you look at these children and you go, if you just left them there, they could do nothing for themselves. So, Parenting is, you know, not for the, not for the weary, amen, right? It's not, it's, it's not for, you, you gotta, you gotta get up and put your pants on and just get to work, right? It's a lot of work and you don't sleep a lot and there's a lot of things that are very inconvenient about having a baby, right? So you need to be faithful to that child and that is a picture of our father faithful to us. That is a picture of God giving us people who are faithful to lead and to serve us. And it's also a picture of the body being faithful to one another. No division. All for the glory of God. Christ's body can't be divided. I mean, you divide a body, what's going to happen? You're going to die. Any divided body is going to die. Any part separated from the body, you're going to die. And Paul was really worried about this church that way. Now what is sought in stewards is that one be found faithful. The fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. The, the fear, the understanding of what the master wants. That's where they need to be. And we see this in, the, in, the, in Acts when different things are going on and you see the apostles running around taking care of different people and then all of a sudden they go, I have an idea. 
We should appoint people to take care of these things because we have to be faithful to the word of God. We have to be faithful to what God has called us to. And they had an aha moment, like, wow. Yeah, those things are important. Yeah, we'll do those things. Yeah, I don't think they just stopped. I think they went, okay, there is a better way to do this. They need to care for one another, and we need to seek God and understand the word of God. And we need to, you know, the scripture says, stop waiting tables. Well, not that they never did that again, but the idea was we have to be faithful to what God is calling us to, and we feel that, and we have to be obedient to that call. First stewards, first servants, excuse me, then stewards, then faithfulness. And I want to talk about something here, and I don't want this to be a, the portion where you go, all I remember from that is this. Now that I say this, you probably, this is all you're going to remember. <laughs> but I don't want you to do that here. So I'm going to, I'm going to touch, I'm going to touch on something that is uh, a cultural dynamic that needs to be exposed in the body of Christ. And it's not here. It's really not here, but I don't want it to live here. And, and really, for your sake, I don't want it to live in you. And so this is going to be, buckle in a little bit. Ready? Buckle in. All right. Five-point harness for all you racing guys. All right. God adds people to the church, just like parents add children to the household. Some of the time it's by choice. I will adopt and bring you in. And sometimes it's by the natural process of the love that the couple has to produce. Right? And I want you to hear me well here. God has an opinion on who he invites and where you go and where you fellowship. He has an opinion. He has an opinion on this, and we need to hear his heart in how he sees households because these are households. Churches are households. We're families. We're families of believers. We're gatherings of believers. We're the body of Christ. We're all those great, wonderful things. And how a household becomes a greater body of Christ is up to God. So stay with me. I want to clearly state that we have lost the value system of God when it comes to allowing God to join us to a people, a body, and a church. The idea of staying put in a family of believers that God has asked you to join has sadly become foreign to several generations who have come to believe that the body of Christ and its leaders are akin to any relationship in the current era being, we can join or leave whomever we want, whenever we want, when things don't go my way. It's, I, I watch, I'm a cyclist, you guys know that, right? I watch the Tour de France, and there's this young guy that I had an attitude with who was a really good cyclist, and I had an attitude with him because I thought he wasn't married to the lady that he had a child with, and I had an attitude. Not really, you know, I don't really have, like, attitudes. But I was like, ugh, man. I mean, he's a winner. This guy's a winner. I'm like, ah, oh, that's such a sad thing that he has this lady and they're having a child. And this whole time I'm like, and he's Dutch. And he's, da he's Danish. I'm like, I'm Danish. And I could like this guy. And, you know, he's a winner. So I want to, I could associate with a winner. I want to associate with a winner. Everybody have a favorite, you know, sports guy person, something like that maybe? So I'd like to go, hey, he's from my home country, you know, so I want to do that, you know. That's more Italian, but I wanted to do that, but I go, this guy, man, just marry the woman. And then I found out later he was. I'm like, oh, good job, Rich. Now I like this guy. But I, I had, he's of the generation, and he's of the culture that says, I will be with you as long as it's good for me. And there's a whole generation rising up to go, I'm going to just be with people as it suits me, and we're going to generate children out of what suits us well, and they won't bind themselves in covenant. They won't do it. It's very culturally popular over in Europe. It's pretty popular here, and that kind of mentality affects even the church, and this is what Paul's going after even in, this, in moments like this. That what is out there cannot affect the word that's in here. We have to go by the word. We have to go by the spirit of God and the things of God. So this, is, this attitude is a self-serving attitude instead of a Christ-serving attitude. And I don't see it here. 
But I would never want it to invade this place. And I don't want it to invade your heart. Because if it invades on one level, it's going to try to work its way in every single level, right? If you compromise in one level, you don't just always just compromise there. It goes deeper and deeper and deeper into your ability to compromise over and over and over again. It's just the way it is. You start one down one thing, I'll just do it one time. <laughs> okay. You made a choice right there to do something. You think that's the last time you're going to make that choice? If it happens to you, okay, repent, step away. But we can't have the things of the culture affecting us in here, so we have to stop it, cut it off. So this is not a thing to take lightly, nor am I saying that God would not have you ever be grafted into another body of believers. I'm not saying that. But there must be a great fear of the Lord when it comes to being a part of a family and then divorcing yourself from them. There's two ways to leave a family. My son just left and moved to North Carolina. Am I upset? No. Am I sad? Sometimes when I go, man, I miss Richie. Oh, yeah. But he left well. Well, how do you leave well? Dad, here's what I'm thinking. Will you pray with me? Mom, here's what I'm thinking. Jossie, here's what I'm thinking. Andrew, Alex, you know, his brothers-in-laws. He goes to Jake. He starts exposing his thoughts to everybody, going, here's what I'm thinking. What do you think? I'm like, yeah, buddy, that is the right way to do it. You have to be obedient to the master, but you're going to live this way as well? Well done. That is amazing. Well done. He made the choice. I don't think it's God. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> he made the choice. I believe it's God for sure, especially now that I'm on the phone with him talking. I'm like, yep, yep, adulting. It's big. So he's made the right choice, but he did it openly, not unto himself, not out of a judgment, not out of any other motive other than, you know, I want to please God, and I believe this is right. So he exposed himself to it, and we sent him as a family. The same thing can happen as a body. We can send. We have sent people. We have sent people out of here where they feel like they need to go, where they need to move. Whatever situation it was, it was an exposed moment. It was an open moment. It wasn't anything that was bad for the family. It was sad, but they needed to go to obey God. Sometimes it's a physical move, and it's okay, and we send. And that's the way it should be done. But when something happens and divides and separates out of judgments and preferences and those kinds of things, that would be more like divorce. And that's a covenant-breaking activity. And God is a covenant God and has nothing of that in his person. And don't ever let that be in you, in your relationships, in your marriages, all the way into the family that you have and the church. I heard a... I heard a Paul, Paul Kidd tells a story on me in, in a way that he, he shows me how he wasn't thinking right and how I came to him as a, as a real friend, and I, I'm going to reverse the story. He didn't feel like he should go support a, a wedding of his adopted son because of the principle of what his son did to get to that wedding and what the relationship was like. And we're all in a meeting, in a leadership elders meeting. And he's saying that, and it sounded right, but the Spirit of God said, that's not right. He needs to be a good dad in that moment, whether the son was being a good son or not. And I said, um, I think you should go. And I, I risked something right there in the relationship, which was really not a risk because we lived life together. We knew each other's heart, and I said, I think you need to be a good dad, whether the son's being a good son. And Paul uses that over and over and over again about how we need to live so intimately with one another to talk about things openly so that we can know and help each other. So if there's something that's going off the rails, we can help each other bring it back on the rails. And this is how we should live life, and this is how leaders should live. Families should live. Submit yourselves one to another, has been commanded to us. 
So when an elder who leads a people of God is in sin, even though this is not what Paul's talking about, I wanted to jump in here real quick. Paul spoke to Timothy about this and about how to care this way and what it takes to bring an accusation. When we have an accusation against one another, we need to follow Matthew 18. There's actually instructions on what to do when you have a problem with someone. You go to them. <laughs> what? That's so crazy. You go to them if you have a problem. But here's what you don't do. I internally have a problem, and they don't know anything about it, but it's all bound up in me, and I think I need to get this on my chest, and I want to get, hey, by the way, everything you've done has really offended me, even though you didn't know it. That's not what you do. It's whenever there's an offense that is betwixt, between you that has affected you both, and the outcome of that offense is aware, then you go to that person. Otherwise, it's repentance in your own heart. It's getting your own heart right. But whenever there's something that has brought a chasm, affected you both, and it's aware of both, when you go to that person, you ask for your forgiveness. And if they can't hear you, you bring a friend next time. But it's always going. Well, they should come to me. No, no, no. It's always going. Why? Because the division, someone's got to cross the aisle. Someone's got to cross the gap. It's always going. Have you ever noticed that? It's always going. Put your big pants on, put your belt on, and go. So in relationships this way, or in leadership examples of what to do, both, in both cases, the fear of the Lord must be in those moments, and forgiveness is still the outcome of every situation. So Matthew 18, 21 says this, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, hey, how many times must I forgive my brother who's been doing these things, who sins against me, as, uh, as many as seven times, and we all know what is it? Uh, no, not seven, but I tell you, 77 times. I don't even know if I can count that many. Okay, exactly. Stop counting, forgive. Just stop counting, forgive. So forgiveness is always the outcome that God has, and Paul was after that in the division of that church in, in Corinthians. So 1 Corinthians 4 now he talks about himself. For I am not aware of anything against myself. <laughs> like, wow. That's amazing. I heard a preacher say that once and then come to find out things were going on. So it's amazing he says that. And we can trust Paul in this moment, I believe. But for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not acquitted because of this. I love that. I don't, I'm pretty sure... I'm clear, clear between man and the Lord in this moment. But just because I think it, that doesn't mean that it's not really happening. And I love, I love how he says that. For I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I am not acquitted because of this. Your conscience is not the acquitter. You know, the, the person, the thing that is the utmost authority in the law in your life. Your conscience is not that. Holy Spirit can sound like your conscience, but he is not that. The one who judges me is the Lord. Now that's the fear of the Lord. So he's saying, as far as the scripture is concerned, the word of God, I am not in sin. But yet, I'm not acquitted because of how I think. The one who's going to judge me is God. That's the fear of the Lord. So in verse 4, Paul uses himself as that example. That in his conscience, he could not think of anything that violated the heart of God. However... Knowing that conscience is not the supreme judge, Paul knew that there is a judgment coming in his life at the end. There is a judgment coming. Woo! Yes, there is. Our takeaway here <laughs> is that anything that begins to separate the body of Christ tends to begin when we begin inspecting the things that are above our pay grade. Or we lean towards our own desires at the center of judgments. The things that are going to separate you from one another are the times where you try to inspect things in people's lives that are above your pay grade. And you start judging things out of your opinions. Hmm. I don't think I'd do it that way. Not that I've ever done it before, but if I were, I wouldn't do it that way. 
And those are the things that the judgments come to give us preferences that will choose to separate you from the body of Christ. It's pretty vicious. It's pretty ugly. And it's pretty sad. The things that separate us from one another tend to be the personal judgments and pre preferences that we allow to live between us. And sometimes I wonder how much of what we regard as sin are just the things that collide with our preferences anyway. I think sometimes we think sin are just the things that collide with what we prefer. Well, that must be sin, because I don't like it. Matthew 5 says this. Matthew 5, 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the evildoer. But whoever strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other to him as well. Oh, you, got, oh, you like that? Okay, yeah, okay, try this one. Like, how many have ever done that? Been hit and you go like, is that all you got? <laughs> Give me another shot. No, we tend to fight, right? And, and Jesus says, don't resist the evildoer. <sighs> Come on. Righteous anger? No? Okay. <laughs> We try to use the scripture all the time. Huh? Just like disciples said, Lord, we shall call down fire upon them. And Jesus is like, <sighs> have you not learned anything about why I'm here? <laughs> Matthew 5. <laughs> We're not doing a barbecue this week, guys. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> Matthew 5, verse 39. But I say to you, do not resist the evildoer. Well, whoever strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other cheek to him as well. Verse 40. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, give him your coat as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go two. Give to the one who asks you and do not reject the one who wants to borrow from you. No, you can't borrow my tools. Okay, you can borrow my tools. You have heard that it was said... Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, the master, the lead rower, the one who's beating the drum, the one who is the king, I am redefining that to say, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be like your father in heaven. Woo! So that you may be like your father in heaven. Since he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, pss, what reward do you have? Not that he said it like that, but I like it. Even the tax collectors do the same, don't they? They even like people. And if you only greet your brother, what more do you do? Even the Gentiles do the same, don't they? So then, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And how is he perfect? He chose you. And loves you no matter what you do. That's tough. That is tough. But that is what unifies us. I choose you. I love you. Despite what you do. Even if it offends me. Even if it offends my principles. I still love you. I still pray for you. I still care for you. And whatever you need, I have for you. That's how the Father loves us. And that's how he wants us perfected. Being perfect is to love as God loves. Hmm. James said, do not speak against one another, brothers and sisters, family. He, he who speaks against a fellow believer or judges a fellow believer speaks against the law and judges the law. And then Paul gives us the other side of a coin saying, but now I'm writing to you to associate, to not associate with anyone who calls himself a Christian who is sexually immoral, greedy, a daughter, verbally abusive, drunkard, swindler, do not even eat with such a person. There is a, a place where we must separate. It's when a believer is in sin that is affecting the body, that is affecting people, and they're still calling themselves a believer, and they will not repent, and people have gone to them the right way, 
talked to them, admonished them in the Lord, brought the truth to them, shown them the word, and they still do it, Paul says, separate yourself. That's when you do it. Otherwise, love as Father loves and be perfect like the Father. So to continue, last two verses. Verse 6. Paul continues in verse 6, reflects these same ideas upon himself for for the sake of those he's leading. He says this, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos. Like, where's Cephas? Where'd Cephas go? I don't know. To myself and Apollos because of you. All these things I'm saying, all these things that I am painting pictures of, I'm applying to Apollos and me first because of you. I have to. I have to be these things, not just talk about these things. Brothers and sisters, so that, so here's the so that, through us you may learn not to go beyond what is written. That's a powerful thing. Not to go beyond the scripture, not to go beyond the truth, not to go beyond the history of our people, not to go beyond what God has said. Don't go beyond, don't add to the scripture. There's the scripture. Not to go beyond what is written so that none of you will be puffed up in favor of the one, Apollos, Cephas, Paul, against the other. For who concedes you any superiority? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you received it, why do you boast as though you did not? By the way, everything's yours, but you're, you're in Christ. And Christ is in the Father. What was not given to you? It's all the Father's anyway. So his mode of his conversation is just like a, like a loop over and over and over again to get a point across that it's not about the gift and the way it's wrapped, it's about the, what was inside, like Caleb talked about. It's what is on the inside that God wants, that God wants to produce in you through your salvation, through the work of the cross. It's not about different little nuances and the bows and the different colored paper and those kinds of things. Yeah, they're pretty, and you know there's something special in there. Yes, there is, but it's not about the wrapping. It's about what's on the inside. It is about what's on the inside. When Paul was saying, hey, who concedes you any superiority? He's really saying, who separated you as something distinct with the right to judge? That's really what that meant. And we use the word superiority. Paul was reiterating what he said at the end of chapter 3 again. Everything belongs to you, but you belong to Christ. And Christ belongs to God. So what do we do then with this admonition? What's Paul's explanation to the church in Corinth? How does that apply to us? I think we need to do what he did and apply these things to our life for the sake of others. Yeah, for you. Yeah. But really for others. The fruits of the Spirit are not for us, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I got those things for myself. I'm with myself all day long. I love myself. Fruits of the Spirit are for everybody else. They have to be produced in us, right? So here's what we need to do. Out of how Paul applied these to himself so he could become a God the Master wanted him to be as a part of the family. We need to let the Holy Spirit come and measure our hearts. It's that simple and that powerful. He needs to come and have permission. Holy Spirit, I give you permission to measure my heart. What I have called preferences are really just judgments. And they don't belong in the family. They don't perfect me into being like the Father. And in fact, it's just the opposite. We need to let the Holy Spirit define what being the body of Christ is and what part of the body we will choose to to play. We do choose, by the way, to be the part he's assigned us and asked us to be. So can we do that? Can we ask the Holy Spirit to measure our hearts today? 
The benefits, unity. The cons, separation. Your heart, God is after your heart. No matter what the situation, whenever you're having trouble, go, God is after my heart here. God is after my heart. Yeah, it's tough. These situations are tough, demanding, impacting. But in all this, he's after my heart. He wants me to trust him, to have my value system based on him, not on these situations, this impact, what is going on. He wants my heart. Can we do that? Can we be a people who repent when the Holy Spirit asks us and shows us something? Can we be quick to repent so that we can be unified as the body of Christ? And maybe you need to go. Go to somebody. Maybe you need to go to somebody and say, that thing that has separated us, I'm going to fall on the sword and take the ownership of it and be the son or daughter who's going to come and get this away from being in between us, get this out from between us today. And I'm, I'm going to get my big, big pants on, and I'm going to do that. Because externally, there's something between us that is internally formed, and it must go away. Maybe God will ask you to do that. Maybe you need to do that right now. And all that, that would do is produce family. All that's going to do is produce unity and make you more like the Father. Can we do that? Can we ask the Holy Spirit and be bold enough to ask him to measure our hearts today?